Hello and welcome to the Utah Puck Report. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, uh, kind of doing this one by myself today. Uh, we we're going to have Jordan Parisi, we we're going to have Gary, but uh, I don't know, Paul, you're, with your schedule and my schedule and their schedule, it was hard to get everything to, to sync up, but today our guest uh, is a... Uh, I'm going to call you a local legend. <laughs> I don't know about that. As, as long as I've been playing hockey, your name's been, uh, you know, talked about and talked about and talked about. Anyway, Paul Skidmore is our guest today. Paul, thank you for being on the show. Nice to be here, Jay. I'll tell you, um, when I go back to even, like, when I started hockey, and that was, like, 1988, and I, you know, right around there, and I, I wanted to be a goalie, and some of the early goaltending that I ever saw was you. And the first thing anybody had told me is, is Bill Miller. Um, he was going to be my coach at Murray High. I'd never played, and he's like, "Well, you can catch things because you played baseball, but we're gonna we're gonna send you to Paul Skidmore." And he was just telling me what an honor it was for me to be on the ice with you. And I and I got it to an extent, but I didn't get it all the way because, you know, just being a new hockey player and like, here's Paul Skidmore, <laughs> and uh, you were nice enough to put on a little clinic and teach a lot of us how to do skate saves and learn how to play hockey. But anyway, Paul, so for me, this is a big deal. To have you on the show is a, is a huge honor for me. Um, any success I have, I have to attribute to that first hour that I spent on the ice with you. But I remember I remember when, um, when we had that clinic, and it was just, it was basically teaching the basics. Yeah. You know, I mean, just how to, how to move, how to cut angles down, how, you know, I mean, just throwing pucks at you, catching them, and, you know, just to see how, how you reacted around the, around the net and stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I remember, you know, a bunch of kids that uh, locally, uh, there was a, a, another young girl, Lisa Stewart, oh. who, who uh, I remember teaching, and, and she, was, she was a pretty good goaltender. There was a lot of young ones that were, that were very good around here oh. you know, that, that went on to do travel teams and, and play in other places and, but it was, it was pretty cool. It's funny. One of the things I learned as a coach and as obviously as a parent, as a goalie, um, cause I never played travel team. I was too old. I was 16 when I started hockey, but you know, with my son and then coaching here, I coached here for what, 18, 19 years. Our goalies were always good because our teams aren't, weren't always great. <laughs> we always had like one line of really competitive kids and then everything else was basically left to the goalie. And you know, so a lot of it was so the, goal, the, goalies, the goalies got a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, the goalies <laughs> got a lot of work. So, Paul, tell us about your early life. I mean, you're not from Salt Lake, so tell us about getting into hockey and where you grew up. I grew up in Long Island, New York. Um, my first recollection of anything about hockey was I was going on a trip, and my father was taking me. We met in a car, and he said, bring a pillow along and the whole bit. I had no idea what was going on. And we get this great big building and walking in. And little did I know that my father was a half owner of a hockey team out in Long Island. It was the first professional team out in Long Island before the Islanders were ever out there. And they were called the Long Island Ducks. Oh. And the Long Island Ducks actually had a few players on it that were um, uh, in the movie Slapshot. So, uh, you know, they, they've actually moved on and stuff. But I, I grew up, I was about nine years old, and I'm walking in the arena, and it was the only sport that I just recognized by myself that I wanted to do. I was pushed into baseball, pushed into football. I was always small. And then uh, there was a whole bunch of kids down on the ice, skating around, and they were fixing the ice because there was a basketball game the night before and stuff, so we were putting the ice back down. And I just looked down and I said, that's what I want to do. Oh. Started off playing, uh, you know, just local house league hockey and uh, started off as a right wing. Oh, really? And uh, I, was, I was okay. I mean, I learned to skate on my own, you know, just holding on to the side of the boards and, and just skating around in circles and, and the whole bit. And nobody ever really taught me. But uh, it, it came a time to where we were playing organized in house league and stuff. And we had a kid on our team. His name was Richard Campisi. And uh, I ended up going to Providence College, one of the best stick handlers I've ever seen in my life. And he would go around and he would actually score seven, eight, nine goals in a game. Well, the, the goalie that we had on our team, his name was Tommy Dillon. He, he was playing goalie because his older brother had the goalie equipment. <laughs> yeah. 
So he got he got about six, seven goals scored on him in a matter of maybe ten minutes, and he just had enough, threw his equipment down, and uh, I said, that's it, I quit. So the coach came over to the bench and said, well, who wants to play goal the rest of the game? So I looked down one side of the bench, looked down to the other. Nobody did anything, and I raised my hand. And the only reason why is because the goalie equipment looked cool. Oh, yeah. Waffle pad, you know, <laughs> catching glove, leg leg pads that, you know, just covered everything. And I went in and just kind of started. That's how I got started. Wow. We got kind of reversed. I went into goal, and he came out and played forward and stuck with it ever since. Yeah. That's funny, that that uh, lure of the cool equipment. Because now the, the gear is even cooler now, right? Uh, and I wouldn't be able to stand up with it now. Are you kidding me? Oh, I, look, I look at the styles of play now, and it's, yeah. just, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy how much it keeps changing and uh, evolving. And it was weird because it was stagnant for a long time, and then it was Ed Belfour and, and a couple of his friends kind of broke down hockey and then just kind of recreated goaltending. Yeah. And that's and Belfour's thought was all right. When goalies butterfly, we're done. Like now, <laughs> the guys are going down. Like learning how to butterfly, it's awesome because it was it was stopping a lot more pucks than when we would just stand up. Which is that's how I was. I was a stand up goalie. Yeah, and uh, stand up but not stand out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and then yeah, and then they, all of a sudden they break it down and they're like, let's apply science to it and let's figure this out. And now those guys. To watch those guys move around, like, I just, it's such an art form to yeah, me. Like, it's it, so beautiful. It is. And, you know, the thing was, is my, one of my biggest heroes who started the whole thing was Tony Esposito. Yeah. And to think back years, that many years ago that he had that style, and it's actually gone back to that now. You know, I mean, half the game, they're on their knees, yeah. you know, just sliding back and forth and the whole bit. And I can understand low shots, but they're getting picked apart as far as all these shots <laughs> go and go yeah. top shelf. Well, that's funny. Like, just players learn. Whatever the goalie does, the players are going to learn to pick it apart. And then the goalies figure out whatever they're doing to be picked apart. And then they, they evolve. And then, they, then the forwards evolve again. And it's it's fun. So you grew up, you're, you're playing, and... When did you know you were going to play in college? Like, did you play juniors? Uh, well, the, the thing was, was around here, you know, you, you play house league and then you play travel team. Yeah. Back where I grew up, my father drove me everywhere. And the thing was, was that it would be like if I played for Ogden, Salt Lake, and Provo, three different house league uh, organizations. And then two out of the three, I played travel team. So I'm playing, uh, my, my dad used to pick me up from school. I, I played high school soccer. And then my equipment would be in the back seat of the car. I'd get dressed in the car. And then I'd be on my way to the rink for a practice. And then I'd go from the rink to another rink and have practice. And I did this for years. Yeah. Uh, my dad actually counted one year. I was about 13 years old. It was... Uh, he had a yellow notepad that used to keep track of all my games. In one year, not including practices, I played 289 games. Oh. And that's not including practices. Wow. But that's what he felt it would take to improve uh, in order to, uh, you know, just, just get, get better at, at the basics. And then uh, from then on, I went to hockey camps every summer. So I right. went. So I went to you know eight weeks. I was gone every summer, but I'd go to the hockey camps to where the college coaches would teach. Lou Lamorello, who is with yep. uh, who's he with now? I mean, he I think he's with the Islanders now. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, he had coached Providence College. Um, Lenny Siglarski, he was the coach of Boston College. Uh, I mean, all these coaches in Division One, and that's how I got noticed. Because I'd be every summer, and so they would kind of follow me, you know, kind of get my dad would get to know him every every summer, every year, and the whole bit, and you know, they'd just talk and everything else, and then uh, it just came time to where uh, it, it was time to make a decision as far as what school I wanted to go to, and uh, I was I was actually picked by eighty colleges. To I had my choice. Wow. I, I, Ivy League, and it, I didn't have the grades for it, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I could have gone to Notre Dame at that time. They were a Division One school, and 
uh, Harvard, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of colleges back east. But uh, ended up picking Boston College. It just uh, some of the players there went to prep school, same school that I went to, and so they were kind of like a year ahead of me. And they, you know, went on to Boston College. I had one more year, and then I'd follow them and, and the whole bit. But they kind of like pushed me into it, kind of coaxed me into it. Right, right. But uh, that's basically how I mean how I got into. Um, playing college, and then after college, uh, well, well, during college, my freshman year, I was uh, uh, well, actually we were playing in, in the Bean Pot Tournament in Boston. Oh yeah, uh, top four schools were Northeastern, Harvard, uh, Boston University, Boston College. That first year, we ended up winning the tournament as a, I was a freshman, and I won MVP. Well, who was sitting in the stands that year was Emil Francis. Okay. Emil Francis was president and general manager of the St. Louis Blues. Right. So it was about a year, year or two later that uh, I was drafted by St. Louis, and that's how I moved on. That's okay. Um, you had also a run-in, not a run-in, but you had – an opportunity in 1980 to play for the Olympic team or to, or to go through the tryouts. Right. Uh, that was held in the uh, uh, Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. Oh. And, uh, God, they all the top players. I mean, all the guys who were on the you know, 80 team that were all there, and, and uh, they came from all over the country. Ruzioni, Callahan, uh, Jimmy Craig was there, goaltender from Notre Dame was there, I was there. And I was actually the last goalie cut Oof. before – before the team was picked, yeah. it's just like so. I, I was a little bit bitter. I never, I never watched the uh, you know the Miracle on Ice movie or anything. Oh, just, no. And I, no, no, I just, I just moved on and just said, okay, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty good movie. But I can, I can, I can understand. I mean, yeah, I have to be that close. Well, especially when when we used to play uh, uh, Boston University at least six times a year. I mean, they were just, you know, two miles down the road in, in, in the same city, and they would always beat us. But any time that there was awards uh, between me and Jimmy Craig, I won all the awards all the time. Oh, wow. So in order to win that, you know, MVP and, and best goaltender in the tournament, and then, you know, Jimmy was good. But, uh, you know, and then not to get picked for the team, it was just kind of uh, – I, I, I hold myself a little responsible, too, because it was during the summertime, and I really wasn't in the best shape okay. uh, during the off season and stuff. And uh, So it's kind of my fault, but I'm, I'm still a little bitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it's it would have been a cool story to be a part of. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what can you do? Things, things just happen. And, yeah, they you know. do. They do. And they happen for a reason, and, you know, and, and just, hey, I had a – I had a good career, you know, playing in Salt Lake, and you got a chance to play up in St. Louis a little bit. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, just made a name for myself out here and, and uh, retired out here and just, you know. So let's talk about that a little bit. You go, um, you finish up at Boston College, and then you sign with St. Louis, and, and what do they tell you? Where are they going to put you? Well, go to training camp after that, and then training camp used to be held in um, – uh, uh, it was a place just outside of about sixty miles outside of Detroit. And I can't remember the name of it, but um, was it Traverse City? Was it back then when they were doing? Because I mean, that's where they st- a bunch of ki- they still do rookie tournaments and stuff there. Not Traverse City. No, it was it was right across from Sarnia, uh, oh, right okay. across on the border, uh, just just right up there. But you know, I mean, you go in there. I mean, there's eight to ten goalies in a camp, and right. and uh, you know, you, you you work out, you you. You play uh, exhibition games and, and things like that, and, and I mean, they they all the coaches sit up there and judge you, and they they just you know have within themselves as far as what they want to do, where they want to put you. You know, do they think you need some more development? Uh, playing in the IHL, and you know that's where I started off, and and then uh, played a year there, and then the next year I went to training camp. I had a really good training camp, and then the kind of kind of forced them to take me into Salt Lake. They already had two goalies there, which was Ricky Hines and, and Doug Grant. Oh, wow. And yeah. they won the championship the year before. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, they brought me in, and then uh, and then they made uh, Dougie uh, 
uh, kind of an assistant coach goaltender. Uh, they, he would practice and, and play when he had to if anybody got hurt and everything. And so it was uh, from then on, just had a really good start. And, and, uh, and uh, I mean, there was one point, I think my first year, first, first or my second year, I went 20 games straight unbeaten. Wow. And uh, I think I did, an, I did an interview. It was it was the 20th game and then the 21st game, or right after the interview, I, I kind of maybe – uh, jinx myself and, and then lost, but yeah. uh, but uh, it was it was a record back in the Central League, and uh, you know that was that was kind of fun. That was we were on a tear. Yeah, man, that's that's amazing. I, I did not know that about the 20, 20 straight games. That's that's pretty cool. Um, what did you think when you first came to Salt Lake? Like coming from Boston, coming from Long Island, <laughs> a bunch of rumors about where, what you were getting yourself into in Utah. Or? Yeah, it, they just said it was a dry state, oh. and and uh, you know they they don't have fun out here in the whole bit, and and it was it was far from you know what you hear and everything. I mean, the first day I, I arrived, I mean, you look up at the mountains. I mean, we were laying out at the pool before you know training camp started, and there's snow cap up on top, and and it was just gorgeous, oh. you know, and and. Uh, from then on, it was just, I mean, the people out here were fantastic. And it's just a beautiful city. I mean, it was always, compared to coming from New York and, uh, and, and back east, it was a clean city. It wasn't big, but it was clean. Um, uh, the uh, crime was very, very low. Um, it was just, just a nice place to, to, to be at, yeah. comfortable. Yeah, and I, I still get that from a lot of players. Um, Trevor Daly, who played here for the Grizzlies when they were in the A and then played for the Dallas Stars for a long time, Detroit for a while, he was telling me one time, he goes, this is undercover, one of the best places to play. He's like, you hear all this stuff about Utah and Salt Lake, and like you said, he heard the same thing. He's like, you can't drink when you're here, and he's like, you can. You know, you can't drink after 1 a.m., but I don't want to anyway. I'm trying to be a professional <laughs> athlete. He's like, but... He's like, it's the women here are beautiful. Everybody here is nice. And the scenery, as far as the mountains, the lake, then you go, you find the Red Rocks. And he's like, it was just amazing to come from Canada and see this. I thought, I thought all the girls were blonde. Yeah. Every, every one of them. But the neatest part about playing out here was at the time, Salt Lake was the only team west of the Mississippi. Oh, wow. So in the Central League, we flew everywhere. Yeah. And it was it was like first class, you know. And just I mean, you just carry your luggage, carry your bag, and you go to the, you know pick up your equipment, and they put it, throw it in the van, and then they take care take care of it, and take it to the range, just you know like they do now. But uh, it was it was always treated as first class out here, yeah. and players who were traded from the uh, American League and came out here absolutely loved it. They never wanted to go back, even no. if, even if they were just on loan for the team for temporarily. But uh, I, I thought that was pretty neat because yeah. by, by the time I finished my career, we busted everywhere. Oh, yeah. I was spoiled. <laughs> I, I, I didn't care for it, but, yeah, it was still good. So tell me, uh, you get a couple games in the NHL, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. Like, tell me what you remember about, like, was it overwhelming? Was it sentimental? Well, let me, let me put it this way as far as how overwhelming it was. I was up practicing with the team, and – we were in uh, Winnipeg, and Ricky Hines was supposed to play. Uh, Mike Lee was hurt, and so I went up to back up Ricky Hines. And what they used to call it back then was pulling the chute. Oh, yeah. As far as, you know, jumping out of a plane, you have a parachute, and just like, you know, you just kind of glide your way down. Well, they, Ricky pulled the chute that night. So I wasn't 100% ready to go. Okay. Uh, so by the time I got the word, I was in the hotel room, and I started shaking. I was just shaking and uh, went out for warm-ups, uh, did okay, but I, I, just, I just couldn't shake it. You know, and usually at the beginning of a game, you get a few shots on you, and you start loosening up. You know, you get a feel for it, and you, and you calm down. Right. I mean, because I, I was nervous every game, any game I ever played. But this one was, was the first. So uh, get in there, and uh, they, they have the face-off, and Doug Smale was the um, center for Winnipeg. 
And we had Ed Kia at the time, and Ed ended up getting injured in Salt Lake because he was sent down and stuff and, and had a brain injury and stuff because he was one of the few last players who didn't wear a helmet. Oh, and he got smacked against, uh, smacked against the boards. I think everybody remembers that. But um, Ed kind of was backing up. Uh, well, nobody held the center up. So he automatically went to the puck. The puck came back to our defenseman, Ed Kia. Ed went to cross over. He tripped over his legs, his, his own feet. <laughs> Doug comes in. He's inside. He, he gets about the top of the circle, lets a slap shot go, goes off my glove into the net. Well, it's now a record-tying <laughs> fastest goal from the start of a game in five seconds. Five seconds? Five seconds. My name's in the record books. I, you know, I heard – so. Um. Steve Metcalf told me about this yesterday. He's like, you got to ask him about it because he'll tell you. Um, is that still the record? I think it's tied now. Okay. I think it's tied. But, yeah. So wow, it was like, welcome to the NHL. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it was a real eye-opener. And it just I, I just put my head down. And went, oh, no, here we go. You know, just then they came down, scored again within, within five minutes. And it was just like, it can't be this bad. Yeah. Uh. But I ended up, I started loosening up a little bit more, and I think we ended up losing about five to three. But for my first game, and I wasn't overly mentally prepared for it, yeah. uh, I, I did okay. It's funny because um, I've been asked a lot of different things about, you know, with the thing that I do being the e-bug, I'm on the bench all the time. I've been on the bench, I can't remember what it is, over 400 games. <laughs> and in the West Coast League, I got put in twice. And in the East Coast League for the Grizzlies, you know, I infamously got put in once. I, I remember that. Yeah. And everybody's like, well, how do you mentally prepare for it? I'm like, you can't. You cannot mentally prepare for being on the bench 400 times and then being put in once. But one of the times, it literally came, I got a phone call from the Allen Americans at, uh, this was for a Sunday game. And they called me at like 11 in the, in the morning. I'm sitting on my couch. They're like, our goalie, uh, just puked. He is sick. He's, uh, he's running out of both ends, and he's not going to be able to go. Can you come e-bug for us? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, can you be here in 20 minutes? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I can be there in 20 minutes. So I get down there and, you know, get my gear in, and I barely make it in 20 minutes. And just the time to literally put my bag down, get dressed, and go on the ice for warm-ups. Well, during warm-ups, the other goalie leaves the ice and pukes. <laughs> and they're like, um... The coach comes to me and he goes, uh, you're starting. And I said, I, an hour ago, I was in my house watching the NHL on TV, maybe having an adult beverage. I'm not ready for this. And, like, how do you mentally prepare for that? And all I could say is, like, okay, like, this is a hockey game. I'm, I'm just going to play hockey, and I'm going to do whatever happens, happens. So, Yeah, you know, and everybody – prepares differently yeah. you know i mean if you know you're going to be starting uh, the next day or it's your turn i mean you got a day's notice you know you get a nice meal you know uh, you know what you what you like to eat you, you rest up you you kind of i used to have spaghetti every single game i played i have spaghetti it was easy to digest and then i'd, I'd go to sleep nap for a few hours but whenever i napped i always dreamt of the game that i was going to play Okay. I would dream of different moves, different players on, you know, how, how I, I would react to shots, whether it be shots from the slot, shots from the point, um, breakaways, um, things like that. And I would mentally prepare myself. I, I played a game yeah. already, yeah. and, and that's, that's how I used to get ready. Yeah, and a lot of goalies do, well, they'll, they'll show up to the rink two hours early and then just go. That's what Jordan Preezy was famous for. Like, you couldn't talk to him. Because he was going to go mentally prepare, and he would just go envision and go through the same thing. He was just in the weight room, maybe his headphones on. And, and you know, a lot of goalies have done this, where they just get in the zone and they start playing, all right, I'm going to run this scenario, I'm going to run that scenario. <laughs> and then, so they kind of prepare themselves that way. And, yeah, I mean, that, and that's awesome if you know you're going to play. But yeah, as a backup or as a guy that just gets pulled up out of the minors – it's kind of hard to, yeah. where am I going to get my spaghetti? I've never been to this town uh, before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just weird things like that that you can't control. Yep. And that's one of the, one of the things that I always fall back to because I was talking about uh, just having all these different um, suspicions or um, 
superstitions, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. I, I had them, and then one time J.P. Parisi tells me, he said, that's, you're leaving too many things out of your control anyway. <laughs> control what you can control. Don't worry about if you got to eat the meal you wanted to eat or – you know, if somebody said the word shut out while you're getting a shut out, he's like, because that's, that's just you're giving other people ammunition to mess with your game. Yeah. Just, and it gets into your head. Yeah. It really does. And goalies, it's so easy to get into a goalie. Oh, anyway. no, we're, that's what they call us a strange breed. And, and we probably were. We had our different little mannerisms about us and stuff. Like you say, you know, superstitions and, and mannerisms. And, and mine used to be I, I would put everything on my left side first and then my right. My left skate and my right skate. My left pad and my right pad. Oh. You know, and, and it was always like that. You had the, you had your brush with the Olympics. You had your stint in the NHL, and you've had this amazing career. Uh, as things start winding down, all of a sudden, some somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, Paul, we've got this thing called roller hockey. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, we want you to give it a try. Yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about your stint with the Salt Lake Roller Bees." It was uh, a way to stay involved after retiring from hockey. Yeah. Um, you know, I was I was working at Hockey Haven. I, I think I'd left there and, and um, actually went back to be an equipment manager for the Eagles. And so after all that, um, I knew Lenny Frigg. Lenny Frigg was one of the top people at Sport Court. Uh, so I went to work for Sport Court, and the owner there, Dan Kotler, was talking about you know starting a team up and this and that, and just yeah, it was it was a <laughs> whole different world. I mean, to be able to move, it was totally different from what I was used to. You can't slide. I right. mean, you basically got to hop everywhere from from side to side and and everything else. And actually, the the, the goalie who was very very good at that was Roger Rougelot. Yep. He was very good. Um, I remember the first game uh, we were playing, and we actually were the first professional team to play in uh, uh, out in California. The Arrowhead Pond? I think so. That was where the uh, – oh, the Ducks were going to play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, I remember that. That was a big deal. Yeah, so we were the first professional team ever to play out there and stuff. And, and here it was, you know, I mean – Huge arena, brand new. I mean, beautiful. I mean, uh, we were, and we were skating on on uh, coated cement, so that you would have good traction and stuff. With the sport court, would slide around, oh. and it was just it was a lot tougher playing on that. But then uh, it was okay. The first game, uh, I went to make a save. The bottom of my skate broke. The wheels fell off. And Roger went in <laughs> and finished the game. <laughs> so, so okay, this is how this is gonna go. But, uh, yeah, it, it was different. And then, you know, of course, the, the teams would come out and play with us. And here we had an outdoor rink. Yeah. Out. The South Town Mall. Yeah. Uh, parking lot. No, yeah. it was horrible. <laughs> Playing at night, you couldn't <laughs> see. I mean, the, the lighting was awful. And, and just uh, the boards, you know, you hit, you'd, they'd hit somebody into the boards, and the boards would move and kink and everything else. And just, it, it was a nightmare. Yeah. But... It was a way to stay involved, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the local guys um, who played uh, senior league hockey around nope. here and stuff uh, were uh, were pretty good at, at it, and uh, eh, it was an experience. Yeah, for me, it was like because I, I got I got picked up the year after the Salt Lake. I didn't live here those years. I I had moved, but um, the the next year they were in Las Vegas, and I went to training camp with them, and then there were. Turnamaz was the player coach, and then there was they came out. I was I was having pretty good camps. I was uh, I felt like I was doing okay, and I and I remember somebody coming to you, and they're like, "All right, well, what do you do for a living?" And I'm like, "I'm a professional hockey player." <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's what I, that's how I was getting money. Like that's the only job I had at the time was playing roller hockey for Las Vegas. But they did an article about they called Cherno a career minor leaguer. With possible starting goaltender, no name, Jay Stevens. That was in like <laughs> Hockey Weekly or whatever. And I immediately got traded. So Cherno traded me the next week for somebody that had a name. I ended up in Phoenix, which 
when you're not in Vegas and you're making 400 a week, it's you can hold on to it a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out it felt like a really big raise. But for me, that was like that was, that's what took me from just a junior college player to like people knew who I was and I had an opportunity to kind of continue playing hockey. Otherwise, I think I was done. Yeah. If it wasn't for that little stint playing roller hockey, and yeah. I think there are a bunch of guys that had that kind of got a catalyst out of or got a jump start off that. Yeah, man. and you know it, it's neat that you can get that, you know, oh. because I mean that's it's something. That's just something you can hold on to for the rest of your life. You yeah. mean, I mean, you, you, we, here we are sitting talking about these stories and everything else. That's stuff that you know I haven't talked about in in years. Yeah. You know, and and uh, uh, you, you'll remember them forever. You know, yeah, and that's, that's so and cool. that's the best part. Yeah, and you may not have talked about them previous, but people talk about it around here all the time. Your name comes up all the time. People still talk about the roller bees. People are always talking about the Golden Eagles and your name. Uh, you know. And, Alizari and those guys and, and turn them as ops. You know, there's, there's four or five names that come up every time and your name is one of them. So it's, it's cool. You've created this legacy here. You know, it's it, it's kind of neat. You know, you know what I think is, is really neat. I'm, st- I'm still getting letters from all over the world who are fans, not necessarily of, of me, but of hockey. Yeah. And I mean, they're sending me pictures that I haven't seen before of me. Coming from oh, Czechoslovakia, coming from Russia, coming from uh, all, all these places that they just want me to sign and send back to them. You know, I mean, they're sending pre-stamped envelopes, right. or they're sending yeah. money in the envelopes to buy stamps to send it back to them, <laughs> yeah. and, and stuff like that. And that's that's pretty cool. I just you know, I would I would go to the mailbox and see something you know from from out of the country and. And I'd go home and just show it to the wife, and, and you know she'd be like, <laughs> "Open it up, open it up," you know, and just and, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's it's nice to kind of keep that going uh, even at this age. Yeah, that's really that's really cool. That's, that's I had no idea that that stuff would be going on. But um, I'm front I'm friends with a couple um, twin brothers that played in the NHL, and um, I called them up while, when I sold my other house and I was moving. I found this box of cards, and I called them. I said, "Hey, I found these player cards from when you guys got drafted." Do you want them to just sign and send to people? And, and they're like, absolutely. Like, I get requests. He says, I look, it's uh, Peter and Chris Ferraro. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're Long Island guys, too. Um, but they're And they both played for the Rangers, and then they played a ton of time in the minor leagues. And they're like, yeah, we still get people requesting them, or people send them to us all the time and have us sign them and send them back. So I'm like, I've got – I think when they got drafted, I was living with them at the time in yeah. Brainerd. And – they came back with these packs of cards, and I'm like, yeah, I'll take a couple. So we each got, like, I had 25 cards of each of them, and I just sent them back to them. They're like, yeah, we'll use them for sure. <laughs> um, so then, speaking of just staying involved, you ran your own shop. You worked in shops. I mean, you were always here and hooking people up with equipment, giving your advice, and then also you able to get to know everybody. How, how was that? like? Um, it was It was – a good way to stay involved, but I was I was still playing senior league. Yeah, um, it was a way to, to still help teach the young kids. I had gotten away from hockey schools and camps a little bit more by about that time, but I mean just just for people to come into the shop and uh, you know I'd outfit them and show them different different things about equipment and new the new stuff and as far as you don't have to buy you know. Yeah. Top of the line stuff. I mean, you'll still get the protection and and uh, just showing things like that. And, and people were just more appreciative than than anything else, you know. Rather than me, I mean, I could I could line somebody up with with uh, you know, I mean, twelve year old with fifteen hundred dollars worth of, of equipment, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and they're going to go out and be skating on their ankles, right? You know? But that was not the case, and uh, you know, a lot of people appreciated that as far as they're just being honest with them and. Yeah. And uh, just showing them different things. And a lot of people learned a lot of things about equipment and about uh, about hockey just by coming in and just talking. Yeah, it, it's surprising. Well, it's funny because my I have a grandson. He's three years old. He lives in Las Vegas, and he's getting ready. To, he's doing learn to skate this uh, at the end of this month. <laughs> and so when I, was, I was telling my son, I said, look, uh, it's easy to fall into. You go into the hockey shop, and you see there's this and that, and you can get the top of the line. I said, he's going to outgrow it in three months. I said, just let me do it. So then I went in, and I started looking at everything, and I'm like, well, I'm only going to buy a certain brand because I'll only wear one brand of skate. And then next thing I know, I'm dropping a few hundred bucks 
when I was trying to talk, I'm like, you could get in and out of there. You could go to Play It Against Sports, and you could drop 50 bucks and have everything you need. Yeah. I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know better, but I also was like, oh, this is his first time. He's got to have these Bauer skates, and these ones are cooler than those ones. So, yeah, even though I know better, I still – Fell into the trap. So you fell, you fell back again because he became a goalie because the equipment was cool. Yeah. Now, here you go buying all this okay. new equipment because it was cool. I'm still a sucker for the same shiny <laughs> thing. Hopefully, my grandson does not become a goalie. But yeah. That's fun. All right, so I opened it up to asking people um, some questions. Uh, one of them that we got was they wanted you to tell us about the 1980 Olympic tryout. So we went through that. Uh, one of the questions I'm sure you'll know where this one came from is what's what's the big deal with cilantro? Why do you why do you hate cilantro or oh, spicy food? <laughs> uh, my son, <laughs> That's uh, what, yeah, <laughs> uh, my son uh, made some um, tacos. No, he made a, um, uh, a salsa. Yeah, and I, I just I just don't eat spicy foods. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty bland. I mean, you know, for me to get excited about Mexican food, it's Taco Bell, you know, or, <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Or I'll, I'll make I'll make my own nachos and stuff at home or burritos and and uh, but I just I stay away from the hot stuff. I mean, yeah. I just I have like, like an acid reflux yeah, to where sure. to where it comes up. But he put all the cilantro in, and it was just like. <laughs> okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. It tastes good, but I started picking it off. Yeah. And just you know, scraping it into the side. And, but yeah, that, I'll always remember that. Yeah, that's funny. It was him that asked that. And it, it's as a firefighter and, and going around and having to cook and eat other people's cooking all the time. It's funny because for some people, ketchup is too spicy, <laughs> and for some people, they can't <laughs> taste it unless it's on fire. You know? uh, yeah, exactly. And then, and then for a lot of as we get older. Sure, it tastes great, but that burning stays with us. You remember it. Yeah, it stays yeah. with us. Um, what do you think of the current state of hockey now in Utah? Are, are, do you see much of it? or You know, I, I honestly haven't. Uh, where I live right now, it's it's an hour south of Salt Lake. Yeah. So uh, by the time I get off work at 4, 4.30, just go home and relax type of thing. Um, I, I, I watch more of the NHL highlights and stuff on TV, but I don't, I haven't followed everything around here. Um, it's just, it's too far to travel. I just don't make the time for it. I got too much going, oh, too much going on for with, with my own family, you know, oh. as far as I mean, we've got older boys now, they've got kids, I've got grandkids, oh. spend the weekends with, with them and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, just kind of, just kind of read about it, hear about it, and kind of go from there. You know, I'm one of those guys too. Where actually, the day I retired, I didn't miss it. Oh, I think, but the amount of games and the way I grew up and how much I played, it was ten thousand pounds lifted off my shoulders. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you're playing 289 games as as, 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 a, as a kid, not including practices. I mean, yeah. that's 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 like house league, house league, house league, travel team, travel team, travel team, and then doing the same thing. I mean, you go on to college and and then playing pro and and everything else. So, so it was it was kind of relief. I mean, as a goaltender, I mean, you know it. I mean, as far as the pressure. Yeah. You know, I mean, every game, you're the last line of defense, <laughs> so they say. Or the goalie is only as good as the team in front of them. No. no. Uh, there's a lot of goalies that shine out there, and the teams don't. Right. But uh, it, it's a lot of pressure. And to have that pressure gone, it's, it's like, okay, I can I can move on now. And then some guys just can't give it up. Well, it- I was surprised that you said that after you retired that you still played the men's league because a lot of the goalies I know that played, the minute they were done, they were done. They didn't even have equipment. Um, Jason Bacash, well, I, I don't know if you know who Bacash was. He played here with the Grizzlies and then went, played for the St. Louis Blues. And then he played overseas, and then he once he was done, he's done. He's like, I, I don't even like, yeah. forget that I was ever a hockey player. I'm, I'm a totally <laughs> different person now. Yeah. And so it, it's fun to see some people still play. Um, do you – are you a St. Louis Blues fan? Is there a team in the NHL that you like to follow? Uh, I like the Islanders. Okay. My next door neighbor, when I was growing up as a kid, uh, built a practice rink 
out in Kings Park, Long Island, New York, where I grew up. And uh, that practice rink ended up being the practice rink for the New York Islanders. That was their first rink when they first came into the league. Oh, wow. So here I am standing off to the side, and there's Bossy. There's um, goalie uh, Smith. Yeah. Billy Smith, I mean, I mean, and I'm watching these guys, and the uniforms were just cool, just yeah. bright orange and blue and everything else. And so the Islanders were good, and I still follow uh, St. Louis a little bit, oh. uh, only because I mean I'm, I'm on Facebook sometimes, and I'll, and I'll see some of the old players as far as Tony Curry and uh, Larry Patey and you know Joey Mullen. I, I still talk with all the time. Oh, and really? Stuff. And oh. Joey lives back in uh, Massachusetts. He's all retired now and everything, and. Uh, he was coaching for a while for with Philadelphia and yeah. all bit. So yeah, we a lot of a lot of us guys, you know, still kind of stay in touch and you know, one phone call once a year or something, you know, yeah. and kind of go from there. So, I got to get Joey Mullen on the show too. What are your thoughts of? Uh, your, I'm sure you're hearing the talk now of the NHL coming to Utah. There seems to be a real possibility. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know if the city can support it. Yeah. Um, the Grizzlies, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't followed them, you know, that much lately. I mean, I don't know uh, how are they drawing. Depends on who you ask. When you go to a game, you know, it's a huge building, and they they say their their ticket sales are between five thousand and sixty five hundred per game. But when right. you go to a game, it looks like there's hundreds of people in there. Right. But, you know, it's a big building. Yeah. If, even if it is 6,000 people and it holds 12,000, it's still going to look mostly empty. Um, I've brought that up a lot. I, I've, I asked a lot of people that know better than I do about, you know, that part of it. And they said, you know, minor league is not a good precursor or does not really tell you how a major league team is going to do in the city. So it has to do with corporate structure. It has to do with... Will other people go? Will it be an event? Will it be, you know, because a lot of people that go to jazz games aren't basketball fans. They're, it's an event. So they go and then they become fans of the team and fans of the sport. So I don't know. That's what I want to ask you. And I, I don't. It, a, lot of, a lot of it is, like you say, business or business minded as far as, I mean, I mean, you go to the jazz game, who can afford it? Unless, right. unless, unless you're in a nosebleed section. I mean, to go to a game, I mean, it's going to cost you five, six hundred bucks yeah. easily. And one big major sports team like that, people will, will maybe go yeah. once or twice a year. I mean, and spend that kind of money, take the family or take their boys or, or something like that. But to have so many, I mean, they're talking, you know, possibly a hockey team coming here, possibly yeah. a baseball major, major team baseball, coming. Yeah. Um, it's just not sustainable for the size of the city. Yeah. The city is growing. Uh, it had pretty pretty good clip, but you look at what people are making as far as salary wise. People can't even get into houses now. Right. People can barely afford apartments. Kids are moving back home. Yeah, that's what we're talking about when you got yeah. here. I my, mean, who, my son is living here now. Yeah, so who who can afford to pay? Hundreds of dollars, you know, for tickets and stuff. I mean, right. unless somebody gives them to you and invites you to a game and stuff. That's the only thing I see. Uh, support, I don't know. I don't know either. I, I don't know. But I, but I think that's a major part of it as far as uh, the way the economy is. To all of a sudden bring a, uh, build a huge baseball stadium. I mean, the hockey rink is great because it's already there. Yeah. But it's, it's expensive. Yeah, it's really – and you think – you know, it's a few hundred bucks a seat. And you want to go with somebody that doubles it. Yep. And then if you're going to do season tickets at 42 games a year. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't afford it. You know, yeah. I just. I just you got to pay to park. And you got to get a. You got to get a beverage while you're there and a piece of pizza. And I'm already broke. You're just talking yeah, about it. I know. <laughs> I can't even afford the game we just imagined going to. I feel like I'm already in debt. I but, know. And that's the thing. And I, I'm going to actually, we're going to look at it in depth the cost of what it is and compare it to jazz tickets, compare it to the Golden Knights. Cause I went, I tried to go in on Golden Knights season tickets with somebody and it's, I can't afford that. Yeah. And you know, I don't even have a lot of debt. I think I've done okay with myself, but I still can't afford to go to more than one or two games a year. Yeah. Well, it's like even now with, with myself, I mean, I, I've got a good job and everything and just 
you know, I still owe, have a mortgage on my house. And my idea was to be able to sell the house. It would have been great selling when the market was yeah. absolutely nuts. But at the same time, to downsize, like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could, I could, I could sell my house for five hundred and sixty-five thousand. You know, but to buy a downsized home, you're paying the same amount, yeah. if not more, because nope. of the mortgage rates right now. Nope. You know, so it's like. Who can retire? Right. I mean, who who can afford all this stuff? I mean, you, you look at you know people who are looking for homes. I mean, they can't even afford apartments or anything. You know, no. just, so it's it, it's sad and it's tough. It's not no. easy right now. It'll be interesting to see if it really happens. I really want it to happen, and then I hope yeah. everybody else makes it work. I'm going to do my as, as much as I can. I'm going to support it here. I'm going to try and you know, sure. I'll talk about it all the time on KSL. That's we're one of the only. In fact, I think we are the only news industry or the news representation in Utah that has a hockey guy. And I'm it. And they're like, Hey, we're I, gonna, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, you're going to do, you're going to write articles. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm not a writer. And they're like, and you're going to do everything. <laughs> and I said, okay, like I want to help grow the game and I want to do everything I can. So I'm going to talk about hockey all the time. And beyond that, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help sell tickets or make people excited about hockey and get them there. And I just hope it happens. Well, now you're talking general manager position here. Yeah, I should be general manager. That's what I'm saying. So if Ryan Smith's listening, you should know. Yeah, you know, we need we need somebody that's enthusiastic about the sport to help promote the sport. And I, you know, yeah, and and I and I do believe in that. I mean, more people do need to get involved. You know, we just shouldn't be a one owner. You know, a billionaire and stuff. I mean, if you have more people involved uh, there's more you can spread out to, to help relinquish costs and and uh just the, the pressure of, of running a franchise like that you know yeah well one of the ownership so that ryan smith one of the the group he's in that owns real salt lake uh one of the main contributors there also owns the new york islanders so there's there's a good tie in there. I heard there's that. People, yeah, there's people in his group that seem to know a lot about hockey. Well, there's what well, you look at. You look at um, Michael Jordan. He's involved with race cars, right? You know, I mean, yeah. everybody's getting involved with everybody else's sport. I uh, mean, it, it's 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 crazy. You yeah, know? it's it's neat to see. Yeah, you know, I mean, you turn on a Sunday afternoon race, and uh, there's Michael Jordan down by the car, <laughs> cars and everything. You know, and, and there's NFL guys down there in the race. Yeah, and, and then there's NHL guys that are buying horses now for yep. horse racing. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. Well, Paul, I can't I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, one question I used to ask all the time that I really like to ask you is if you could tell any, let's take a 12 year old right now, a 12 year old boy or girl thinking about playing hockey right now. And I'd like to see what, what's Paul Skidmore now going to tell that 12, 12 year old getting ready to play hockey. And what do you have a message for their parents? Uh, the, the thing is, I, it's going to be the same with any sport. Um, some people will get involved in, in soccer because it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. Some people will get involved with baseball. I mean, it's, it's a little more expensive, but it's not as expensive as hockey. Hockey is a, a little bit more involved as far as, I mean, just financially as far as the, the equipment themselves. But anything you ever do, do it 100%. If the child does not want to play or – is giving you a hard time about going to the rink and getting the equipment on. And, you know, it just, if they're just not into it, don't push them because you're going to push them away from it. You got to push to a certain extent to where it's got to be fun first. Okay. The experience will come the more they get out there, the more they play, the more they enjoy themselves because they're with their friends who are enjoying it also. A lot of times the parents get too involved, too crazy. It's the same thing in any sport. Oh, yeah. You know, you see that in in, in uh, soccer. I mean, you, you get the moms that are screaming on the sidelines. They're worse than the dads. You know, yeah, just, yeah. but 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 anything. I mean, you make it make it fun for them. You know, and uh, that's, that's really the only thing that that I would say. I mean, like hockey was the only sport. That I was not forced into. Oh. I was forced into baseball, and I was forced to play catcher. You know, <laughs> you know why? My dad says, 
you're 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 in the game the whole time. Oh no, yeah. pitcher catcher. No, nope. uh, I was uh, told to play goal in soccer. You're in the game the whole time. All right. Uh, I was told to play goal in hockey. You have to tra- uh, change it from uh, playing right wing because you're in there the whole time. No. Oh. So it was. Better get your money's worth. Uh, yeah. So it was. <laughs> I mean, uh, but but that that was the sport that I loved, and and uh, and I just learned it on my own as far as that it existed. But if you force them too much, it, it's going to be tough uh, trying to get them to follow through. Them. Baseball, football, yeah. soccer, oh, anything for sure. like that. It's got to be their passion. Yeah, exactly. What do you have to say to all the Sully Golden Eagles fans? Still love you, still. Oh, I miss them. I miss them. I miss seeing you know, all the, the Golden Eagle jerseys that are out there. I, I still look online, and it's amazing how um, uh, a lot of these people still have the old pucks that used to be on the wall in the office. Yeah. Um, you know, I still see Acord's name out there. Um, I miss. Artis, yeah, uh, he was he was great for the sport, great for for Salt Lake. Um, it was it, it was it was a great time of my life because I mean, you look at the fans. When I first came to play here, we sold out. We used to outdraw the Jazz. I remember that, and, and outdrink the Jazz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those bumper stickers. Yeah, yeah, and and you know they. I mean, during the playoffs, they used to bring in bleacher seats. They put up in each corner of the rink to make it legal to bring in extra people, extra fans during the playoffs and stuff because it was a fire hazard. And, you know, yeah. the fire marshals used to walk around a whole bit, but we had the greatest fans here. We really did, and uh, you know when uh, I mean. Larry H. Miller, when he had the team and stuff, I mean, he was a businessman. Right. You know, he had to do what he had to do and everything else. But a lot of people took it out on him as far as, as far as it was his fault. Right. You know, and so they, they got bitter. And, yeah. uh, but it's good to see the Eagle jerseys even at the Grizzlies games and stuff, yep. you know, and uh, keep, the, keep the sport going. And that's what they're going to need to, if they possibly get an NHL franchise. They're going to yep. need those same people wearing those same jerseys. 100%. At at the new NHL team coming into Salt Lake, you yeah. think they should be called the Sully Golden Eagles? Oh gosh, uh, no, 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 I, no, I, 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 I kind of, kind of like to remember that as as our team. Okay, uh, all right, just, but uh, but yeah, it was it'd be, it'd be it'd be neat to see. I don't know if you know for a while, like my son's travel team, he was the they were the. Saw the Golden Eagles, and they were in the Kelly Green and Gold, and back yep. back to those those colors. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, well, that's great, Paul. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for coming out here. My pleasure, Jay. The fans have been just excited to have you on, and and uh, I'm, I'm glad we finally got to work it out. Anytime that anything comes up, you know, you need any info, you need any ideas or whatever, yeah, yeah you, you got my number now. So, yeah. you know, no, oh, we'd love to have you on more so, often, and. So. Um, there's a lot of times we have other goalies on here. Like uh, last year we had Aaron Dell who was playing for the San Jose Sharks on. And then we just made it a goalie chat. We had me and Jordan Parisi and Aaron Dell. And we'd love to have you on there and, and start when we have more goalies on. Because we've got more NHL goalies coming up. And uh, we're going to have Garrett Metcalf on here. Um, I just talked to him yesterday. And he's training. But we're going to sit him down and talk about his journey a little bit more. It would be fun to have you in, involved in any of that. Cool. Yeah, that'd be, I'd be more than happy to. Well, you're a great guy, Paul, and thanks for everything you've done for hockey in Utah. I don't know if you understand that when it comes to goaltending and all of us that went, that whatever we did, even if it was just club college here, and then taught, like that's, that's part of your legacy. Everything that we're doing ties back to you and you teaching us so that we could teach them. So uh, we just appreciate it. I think you really helped grow the game here. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. And that is this episode of the Utah Puck Report.